Hey, thanks for joining us here at our podcast at Vive Church. We know this message is going to bless you. We have a habit here at Vive Church of standing for the reading of God's Word. And I want to continue that today as you turn in your Bible to the book of Jonah. Book of Jonah, Jonah. How many just out of curiosity have a paper Bible with you? How many people carry a a paper version? How many people have a device that you like to utilise for the Word of God? Any iPhone 10s in the audience? Oh, every chance. Every chance. Amen. Jonah chapter 1 verse 1 says this, The Lord gave this message to Jonah, son of Amittai, Get up and go into the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it because I have seen how wicked its people are. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction to get away from the Lord. He went down to the port of Joppa where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. He bought a ticket and went on board, hoping to escape the Lord by sailing to Tarshish. But the Lord hurled a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to break apart the ship. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. Jump down to verse 12 with me. It says, Throw me into the sea, Jonah said, and it will become calm again. I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors rode even harder to get the ship to land, but the stormy sea was too violent for them. They, they couldn't make it. Then they cried out to the Lord Jonah's God. O oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin and don't hold us responsible for his death. O oh Lord, You have sent this storm upon Him for your own good reasons. How many people know that God's got some good reasons for what He does? How many people know that God's ways are higher than our ways, that that His thoughts are higher than our thoughts? We don't always understand, but we do know God's got His own good reasons. Then the sailors picked up Jonah up and they threw him into the raging sea and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power And they offered Him a sacrifice and vowed to serve Him. Verse 17, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Today we're going to continue in our series called Fish. A series where we're really using this idea of fish to unpack the the faithfulness and the foreknowledge of God in our lives and how that works in our lives. And for today's instalment, I want to try and figure out how our free will works with God's will. How does our free will work in with, with God's will? And, and, and as I was preparing this sermon, I had a sermon title and I really wasn't that happy with the sermon title. So, but, but, but the sermon title kind of fits what I'm trying to talk about. The, the sermon title is God's plan, our part. And I know that's not real exciting. So I kind of gave it a subtitle. Are you ready for the subtitle today of the sermon? How many people remember back in the 90s, a little movie about a boy and a whale called Free Willy? I thought we're talking about free will. We're talking about whales. We should call it Free Willy. How many people are ready for the Word of God? Would you go ahead and find 10 people around you, high five them and say, it's time for Free Willy. Come on, let's, let's Free Willy. Amen. Amen. Let's go worship team. Thanks, guys. Love it. Jackson, you're naughty. Amen. 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 Settle down, church. Calm it, calm it down. I'm excited today to continue along a train of thoughts that we really kind of started to unpack last week as we looked at the power of God and working things together. How many people remember last week's sermon? I know it was a whole seven days ago, but... But, but I do believe that last week's sermon, from what I could tell, helped a lot of people. Would you, would you help me out and agree with me just, just by faith, whether it did or not? I, I, I do believe that last week's sermon helped some people. And how many people are happy and, and feel more confident knowing that God can take the good things in our life, that God can take the not so good things in our life, and by His sovereign power, He can work all things together for the good of those who love God and called into His purpose? How many people are more confident as a result from that, I think I am. And I do think it's comforting to know that, that, that God is not limited by my poor decisions or, is, or his, is His purpose altered by negative circumstances, but that through His authorship in life, that 
we can, we can be guaranteed that God's plans will come to pass. But pondering that thought long enough, what is a confident thought and a comforting thought can also be the cause for more questions if we think about it long enough when we consider that the plans and the purpose of God will prosper regardless of circumstance, that His plans will prevail in conjunction with my good decisions and also in spite of my bad decisions, that God's plans will prevail, which can make me wonder that when it comes to God's plans, do I even play a part? Anybody else thought that before? I mean, it's great preaching last week. We talked about God works all things together, that He works the good things, He works the not so good things. He puts them together and despite whether we do good or we do bad, it doesn't matter. God can work those bad things into His good plans and at the end of the day, His results will be achieved because God is sovereign over all things. So which makes me think that if I really think about it, why do good? Why do good? I mean, if God does work with the good things and God does work with the bad things, do I even play a part in this? Purpose, God, or am I simply a pawn? And I think it can be a good question to ask if the decisions that I make have any bearing on the direction of my life or are they simply steps ordered by the Lord? Because I think we'd all agree that as humans, we would hope that our decisions have some effect, that that we have different decisions because we have different personalities. How many people know that? In fact, I was reminded the other day, I, I was laughing about the fact that we... Uh, I was watching this movie one time. I can't even remember the, the name of the movie, but I was watching this movie with, uh, with my wife, Kira, and, and, and Carly, our worship pastor. And we were watching this movie, we were hanging out. And, and I can't even remember. It was a little while ago now. I can't remember the name of the movie. But, but the way the movie went, there was a scene at the end of the movie. There was these, 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 uh, these guys that were after a heist. They were in hideout. And, and you had the, the, the police were and surrounded the house and there was no way out. There was no possible way out. And, and, and you watch the different personalities in play. We, we saw that one of the guys said, man, this is it. I'm going out blazing. So he runs out the doors, guns blazing and gets mowed down. Okay. And then you get the other guy who's like, well, I'm not doing that. I'm going to take my life into my own hands. And he kills himself. And great movie regardless of that position right there. But <laughs> needless to say, we were talking about it afterwards and we were discussing in that situation, what would we do? You know, because it's a likely story. Three pastors after a heist. <laughs> God be prepared, you know. And, and I, they voted for me. They said I was going to be the guy running out guns blazing. That's it. If it's over, go down a blaze of glory. <laughs> Amen. You better just enjoy it. So, so that was me. Uh, Pastor Carly was the one who was going to save them the problem and ended herself. Okay, she was like, this is done. I'm out. Kira, however, decided that she was not going to do either of those options. She was going to surrender. She was going to serve her time, rehabilitate herself and reintroduce herself into society as a valuable member of society, rehabilitated with a new plan. And it was fascinating how indicative of each one of our personalities that was. Which makes me think, if our personalities play a major part in the decisions that we make in life, Knowing that God gives us free will, how does God work our free will into His will? Here in the book of Jonah, we have the biggest fish story in the Bible. That's a preacher joke. (laughs) Jonah is a prophet from God who God directs to go to Nineveh to inform an entire city of their imminent destruction. And And the message he has to deliver is a message of judgment based on God having seen how wicked its people have become. However, Jonah, in an unexpected biblical narrative, does not obey God and instead goes in the opposite direction. And at first glance, it can seem ridiculous, right? That that, that for anyone, let alone a prophet, to to disobey God. A command from God. That, that kind of seems ridiculous, but, but maybe some deeper insight into Scripture will give us an understanding really into the simply seeming simple request from God and why Jonah makes a decision to disobey. Because at Vive Church, we know the power of context when reading Scripture. Amen. And we know that if we apply a historical context to this story, it may help us understand that Nineveh was a city in Assyria, the notorious enemy of Israel. Jonah being a prophet in Israel would be all too aware that for hundreds of years, uh, the Assyrians have persecuted and Israel has suffered at their hand. 
Not only were they notorious, uh, notoriously barbaric in their per- persecution of enemies, but in their own historical literature, they boasted about their cruelty. So Jonah, he decides that as far as he can, as far as his life is going and as far as what he can consider, he's going to go in the opposite direction for two reasons. Firstly, there is the potential that this message would be rejected by the Ninevites and he's going to be killed. On the other hand, there is a, a chance that this message would be received and God would show mercy. Now, now this is a problem for, for Jonah because he knew God to be a merciful God. He's seen God's mercy in action. He's seen how God changes his mind, so to speak. In fact, there's several indications in the Bible where God changes his mind, it says it, which we're not really that comfortable with, are we, when we've got a God who does not change. He's the same yesterday, today, forever, but yet in a situation, God changes his mind. But let it be known that in every situation when God changes his mind, it's always for the better, not for the worse. And so here we've got Jonah who knows that he's got been given a message by God. However, he knows that there's every chance God could change his mind and he does not want God to change his mind and show mercy on a city that he wants destroyed. He don't like the Ninevites. He he doesn't like the way they look. He doesn't like anything about them. So Jonah goes in the opposite direction. And, and before we can actually judge Jonah, I've got, I, I got to kind of remind you to think about all the people that you've wanted God to get in your life as well. Talking about that co-worker that got that promotion that you were hoping for. I'm talking about that girlfriend that got the guy that you saw first. I'm talking about all the things in your life where you couldn't because you were a Christian really flip them off and yell a name, but you just prayed, God, get them. Anybody prayed those prayers? I prayed them. Just get them, God. Just stare them out. You don't know what's coming. You don't know who I work for. And so Jonah is like, I hear you, God. I hear what you want me to do. But nah, I'm good. I'm not about to go into a city that one, I'm afraid of and two, I don't want standing anymore. So the idea that you're going to destroy it, I'm on board with that plan. Let me go in the opposite direction. And so what we see is God's plans being rejected by Jonah's free will. In fact, can we, in fact, can we pause just for a moment because, because I think it's important to consider the criteria for God's selection process, the, the way that God chooses prophets. Because I mean, Jonah... Here, it's an, he, he is an interesting choice by God, wouldn't you agree? Especially as a prophet. Because a, essentially a prophet's job was to speak the Word of God on behalf of God as God spoke it. And so when you have a prophet that is unwilling to speak God's Word, we have a major problem, would you agree? But when it comes down to it, I don't know if this was a good choice, God. In fact, what we see with Jonah when we start to read characters in the Bible, you get to know their personality. And if you know anything about Jonah, what's consistent to his personality is Jonah is both stubborn and reluctant. This is Jonah. Two personality traits that to me seem like an unlikely candidate for God's selection. But if we were actually do a study of the Bible, we would see and, and, and know that in fact, those that God chooses in Scripture we would see that God's selection process is always confusing. Actually, I would go as far as saying this, that the person who man rejects is often who God selects. We see this with Paul the Apostle, in fact, that that he was God's chosen instrument to take the gospel to the Gentiles. Yet at the time of God's choosing, he was working against God. He was, Paul was Saul, a, a Christian killing Pharisee, working against God. And God said, that's my guy. How do you figure God? But maybe there was something about this zealous Pharisee that that showed the kind of passion that Jesus wanted in a person to be able to handle the kind of persecution that would come with the mission. So he said, that's the kind of guy that I need on my team. That's the kind of guy that I have a purpose for. And that's essentially what we see here with our personalities. Can I tell you that God is a God of personality? God's into your personality. God's not hoping that you would change your personality that God gave you the wrong personality. Somehow you've thought, God, why don't you give me a better personality? Because I know the kind of people and you've categorised the kind of people that God used in this world, that the kind of candidates or the personalities that God uses most for His purpose are the people who never have a problem. They're the people who are always happy. 
that the people who are always positive, the people who are never depressed, we're talking about the TV preacher who's too blessed to be stressed. You know those guys are the people who, who never have anything wrong in their life. They're the perfect people for God to use. But I wanna go as far as saying that your personality is perfect for the purpose that God has assigned for you. This is gonna help some people get free. I'm talking to you, Raul. Your personality is perfect for the purpose that God has assigned for you. Because while we see Jonah as stubborn and hard-headed when it comes to obeying God's command, I wonder if the same person who is stubborn could also be steadfast. I wonder if the same person who is hard-headed could also be determined in the right circumstance. Could it be that the perfect person to face off with a city like Nineveh is someone who isn't so easily persuaded or pushed around. Parents, I, I, I wonder if that strong-willed child now may just become a person of conviction under peer pressure. You're frustrated with how strong-willed they are and how adamant they are and how stubborn they are. But when they get into the environment, when the peers are pressuring them, you're going to thank God that He made them stubborn, that He made them steadfast, that He made them not so easily pushed around. Your pain right now may serve for their purpose later in life. Your personality is perfect. For God's purpose. And one of the greatest gifts that God gives us is free will. Would you agree? A gift that God gives us and displays in humanity through a diversity of personality. This is the best way that God shows off this gift of free will is in the diversity of personalities that we possess even in our church. Such a diverse church, such a diverse range of backgrounds, but also a diverse range of personalities. Wouldn't you agree? And there is... Essentially, within this call of God, a freedom to be me, a freedom to be who I am and make the choices that I want to choose in line with my personality. That means for us, we could have easily planted a church in Sydney, in Singapore, or the Silicon Valley. Regardless of, of what God called us to do, He let it be our choice based on what we liked. I'm creating some tension in this church. I love it. Get you right where I want you. You know, like, that sometimes we often think that God's will is this automatic path that He has us on, that we don't really have any choice, but somehow the choices that we choose were already what He predetermined anyway. So, so is it really free will at all? But God lets you choose. God lets you choose. God's will is not some cipher that we need to spend our lives decoding. In fact, when God promises connected to His will, what His promise is, is that His presence will go with us wherever we go, whatever we do. We see this in Exodus chapter 33, verse 14. It says, The Lord replied, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Matthew 28, 20, And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So while God promises us His presence, much of my destiny is inclusive of my own decisions. I thought I'd got to let, get a little more amens from, from the single people here. Because that's good news for you, that God lets you choose. God lets you choose. I hear people all the time saying, well, I'm praying for God to bring the one. I hate to burst your bubble, but God says, why don't you choose the one? Just choose one. But when you choose, make sure you apply wisdom because once you choose, you're stuck. So make sure you choose right. Amen. You're stuck. Sorry, you. You get to, not a got to. Amen. <laughs> you not stuck. I'm not stuck. You're stuck with me, honey. But instead of turning this into a relationship sermon right now, I want to talk about the idea of free will that God has given us to decide our destiny. And if God has given us free will to decide our destiny, then how does God achieve His will? How is God's will achieved if our free will 
plays a significant part because here in Scripture we see Jonah exercising his free will and rejecting God's plan by sailing in the opposite direction. Maybe we could put it this way, that, that, that Jonah exercises his free wound more than, more than free will. He, he's not, not about to do it. He's, he's not about God's plan. He, he, he won't do it. And if we didn't know how the story goes and we applied the way that we think or expect our free will to work in this setting, then it would be at this point where God's plans fall short. But if that was the case, then God wouldn't be over all things. Would you agree? So what happens in our life when when the won't of man clashes with the will of God? Does God simply force His will on us, meaning our free will isn't really free? Well, can I suggest that when it comes to the purpose of God in our life, there are two major parts that are in play. The first part, and also one of the major themes of the book of Jonah, is the sovereignty of God. Would you write down the word sovereignty? This is going to be important for our time together. Because what we see as soon as the ship departs, Jonah and the other sailors find themselves in a ferocious storm. And upon the revelation that Jonah is the reason for the storm, they throw him overboard. It says this in verse 17, Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Here we have a display of God's sovereign power revealed through His foreknowledge. God having divine foreknowledge, and in His divine foreknowledge, He had arranged for a great fish, a great fish to be swimming in the same vicinity as Jonah's ship, so that at the moment that Jonah sank to the bottom, the fish would swallow him. Now, whether this was a giant fish or a whale or an orca or however people have described this fish, trying to rationalise God's miracle and plan and figure out, is this possible? The essential element of a miracle is that it cannot be done by man. It is not possible, but by God. So regardless of this is a friendly shark or not, regardless of what the fish was, the story is not about the fish as much as it's about God's faithfulness to rescue us in every situation and display His sovereignty over creation. This is essentially what the Bible is trying to illustrate. And maybe I could talk to you about the sovereignty of God for a moment because God's sovereignty is important for us to know about because it talks about His preeminence, His power and His authority as one of the most fundamental principles of Christian theology. The sovereignty of God means that He has total control over past, present and future, meaning His will is therefore perfect and His timing is impeccable. God's timing in your life, although you thought God is always late and God isn't on time, I'm here to tell you God's timing is impeccable. God's timing is precise. And so what we see with Jonah being thrown overboard is we see God sending a fish not as a reaction to to yet another unexpected move by man's free will, where God is now forced to respond to something He wasn't ready for, but He sent the fish according to a pre-arranged plan. It says the Lord had arranged a great fish. I love the way in the New King James says it, that God had prepared a great fish, which is suggesting that long before Jonah's indecision, The fish had been appointed and positioned by God, poised to achieve God's purpose. That long before even God gave Jonah a command to go to Nineveh, He had created a fish, positioned a fish, grown a fish to a size that would support a man of Jonah's size, so that in the moment of Jonah's indecision, pre-arranged, pre-planned, pre-positioned was a fish poised ready to achieve God's purpose, even if man wasn't. You thought God was limited by you, didn't you? God can use a donkey if He has to. God can use anything He wants to. It's our privilege that God chooses to use us. So here we've got Jonah. Jonah has gone into the drink and he's in the belly of the fish for three days. Three days he became a prisoner in the fish. In many ways, this was where Jonah becomes a foreshadow of Jesus 
who went into the belly of hell for three days. And whilst Jonah was in the belly of a whale and through a prayer of repentance and was released from the belly of the fish, we see that Jesus won forgiveness and were resurrected from the bottom of the grave. So the two become one. They foreshadow each other. Jonah becomes a foreshadow of Jesus. But Jesus is greater than Jonah because Jesus did not sin. He did not run from the will of God, but ran towards the will of God, knowing that it would position him in the belly of hell, but won it for our sake. And so this story has incredible significance and significance on multi-level and we could preach a whole series just on Jonah but it's only one part today so we need to make sure we continue talking about the idea of free will connected with sovereignty two things that don't seem to go together would you agree sovereign free will sovereign being over all things and free will yet our decision and what we see clearly in this book is Jonah in a display of God's sovereign power God shows His rule and reign over creation. In fact, we see this with the wind and the waves. We see it with the fish. Later in the story, you see it with a plant and you see it with a worm. And yet while God controlled all these things by His sovereignty, what He would not control was Jonah without his surrender. This is a powerful point. For us to know when it comes to free will and God's will, God can sovereignly control all things. He is above all. He is preeminent over all creation. There is whatever God wants to do, He can do at any time He wants to do it. He's not bound to any man. He's not bound to anything. He is bound only by Himself and the promises that He makes. And yet, whilst He is preeminent over all things and sovereign in all situations, and he controls all these elements. What we do not see him do is control Jonah without his surrender. And I'll be honest, I used to hear this story taught in Sunday school as a kid. Uh, how many people went to Sunday school? Any, any Sunday school students here? All right. What about in San Francisco, San Jose? I'm sure there's far less, but here in Palo Alto. There was a good majority of people that went to Sunday school. How many people, one more time, you went to Sunday school as a kid? All right, there's a fair few people. I don't know if you learned this story in Sunday school. You had the felt board and the felt shapes. and We don't do that in this Sunday school. We should bring that back to royal kids. How many people know our kids are not getting a solid theology without felt craft? In fact, we were out the other day, and what's in fashion right now are velvet shirts. Anybody wearing a velvet shirt today? You're ahead of your time. And, 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 and I was, Kira's like trying to convince me to buy a velvet shirt. I just said, you just want to put your hands on me, that's all. But, but I refused because I said, when I was in kindergarten, at Sunday school, my mum made me wear a brown velvet, it was like a brown gold velvet shirt. And I never got over that, so I am not buying a velvet shirt, Amen. But you go ahead. Anyway, what was I saying? Sunday school. So Sunday school, we have, I was taught this story of Jonah as as the wind, the waves, the ferocious storm, and the fish were all a repercussion of Jonah's disobedience. So don't disobey God. That's kind of how we were taught. Anybody else taught like that? Or you went to a good Sunday school? All right, so we... (laughs) And that's how it kind of is what develops our theology in life. That when it comes to the, the, the will of God, it becomes this impossible task to decipher because I don't want to make a mistake and end up in the bad zone. I don't want to end up in the zone where now I'm, uh, it's like karma all of a sudden. God, do bad, get bad. Now, because I didn't obey God's will, then now I'm in, in a product of my own circumstance. So now I look at every negative situation in my life as a result of doing something bad where God's disciplining me and therefore I earn it. So then I should have got it right somewhere along the line. But now we approach God's will as this coded thing that we have to somehow figure out and it's elusive. It's elusive. What is God's will? What's God's will in every situation? What's God's will in this season? I thought God's will for my life was to be a doctor, but now I have children. I've got to be a stay-at-home mom. Did God's will change for my life? Or what's the plan for my life? And we often approach God's will with a whole lot of nerves and nervousness. Would you agree? 
But I like what the Bible says in Colossians. God says, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it indeed. Do it, do it with an attitude of saying indeed and an honouring God. Just do it to the goodness of God. Do whatever, whatever you find yourself, whatever you find your hand, whatever, whether it's being a doctor or a stay-at-home mom, in whatever, in, 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 in every element, do it with a deep conviction that God, I do this unto you. So this is a powerful understanding that God lets me decide a lot of the direction of my life. Do I go into medicine or do I go into ministry? God lets you choose. Am I failing God's will for my life if I didn't go to Bible college and I didn't go preaching? Could I have been just as effective for God ministering in a place where my skills that he gave me to operate in, because we all know I'm so medical from last week. But hypothetically, if that was a skill that I possessed, would I be failing God or would I have a significant impact for his kingdom? We could sit here and debate. Would I have as much impact for God in San Francisco as I would in Shanghai? We can see that Ultimately, God says, choose, choose. So therefore, the idea of getting the decision wrong becomes something that we need to ponder because here we've got real clearly, God's very clear. And wouldn't it be great if it was this clear in life that God said, go here. Then you'd be like, no room for error. I'm on my way. But, but many of you want to know what God's will is for your life in great detail, but I've got to assure you that you don't because if you knew what it would take to get to where God wants you to go, then you wouldn't even start the journey because this is what we see with Jonah. He sees where God wants him to take, but he also knows what it means to get to the destination. So he's like, uh, I'm out, I'm going the other way. And that's how we would respond often to God as well. So that's why God says, walk by faith, not by sight, meaning each step, just do one step, just do one step, do one step. Because when you look back over your life, you'll see, God, you brought me all that way. You're amazing. But here we've got a situation where we learn from Sunday school and the way it was taught in Sunday school is that, that, that all this stuff in Jonah's life was, was, was God paying him back for his sin. But something I realized through studying Scripture and what I know now about God and His character is that this is not a story of God paying Jonah back for his sin. This is actually a story of God bringing Jonah back from his sin. And this changes the game. This has changed the way that we approach God's will in our life. That, that, that when we feel like this is God being mean, this is actually God in His full mercy. Because the storm and the great fish were God's way of getting Jonah's attention and revealing His sovereign power. Because the fact that Jonah refused to go to Nineveh ultimately reveals a lack of understanding on Jonah's part of exactly who God is and what he's capable of. Otherwise, he would have run willingly into God's plan. Instead, he went the other way. And so what we're going to find is that when it comes to God's will for our life, lining up with our free will, that so much of what God wants to do in the idea of surrender, and we don't like the idea of surrender, but so much of what God wants to do in surrender, so Maybe I could change the word surrender because I know every time I say the word surrender, it's like a little, little twitch going on the inside of you because it's the same word as submit. And, and so submit and surrender is something that I don't want to be a part of. I want to be me. I want to make my decisions. I want to be a human being and I want to make the decisions for me. So maybe if we just change the word surrender to willing for a moment, could we do that just as an exercise? To, 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 to look at free will as free willing, as God gives us His will, but also He gives us the opportunity to be freely willing, to be a willing participant, to not be dragged along this purpose of life that God has for us, but He presents His purpose aligned with our personality, saying, you're the perfect candidate for this purpose that I have in mind. Would you be willing? God gives us an opportunity to be willing. And so what we see is God persevering with His servant. God does not turn His back on Jonah. God does not look at the fear in His heart and the condition of His soul that caused Him to run in the opposite direction and say, well, you're done. Let me find somebody else. He perseveres 
with Jonah, creating a situation and a circumstance where he can fully reveal how sovereign and how powerful he really is. Not to manipulate Jonah like we often think, is God just causing these situations so then we have no choice? That the only choice we have is, all right, God, I'm in. Don't wanna live in a constant storm in my life. Don't wanna live under constant persecution in my life. I'll submit. That's not the kind of surrender that we see here. What what, what Jonah was getting a front row seat to was just how capable God is of rescuing you from every situation that you find yourself in. And the fact that God perseveres with Jonah gives me so much confidence in my life to know that as a result of my bad decisions, God didn't abandon me. That God didn't leave me in my mistakes. That God didn't leave me in my college days. That God didn't leave me when I made the dumb decisions that I made. But God didn't give up on me and go to the next person. But He said, the purpose that I have for you is perfect for your personality. So I'm going to persevere with you and I'm going to show you and I'm going to train you and I'm going to walk with you. I'm not going to give up on you. So what we see, what we see is we see that that, that, that Jonah goes into the drink. He ends up in the belly of the fish. I've got to hustle. I'm out of time and I haven't got to my main point yet. But it says this. We see, we see that Jonah in chapter 2, something pivotal in chapter 2, almost exactly in the centre of the book. Jonah is broken up into four chapters. And if we kind of got the weight of the verses and the chapters and we split them right in two, we would almost exactly find this verse in verse 8. Because after three days in the belly of the fish, Jonah prayed a prayer full of misery, full of despair, full of loneliness and loss. And he says this incredible line, which is the turning point in Jonah's life. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 8, let's put that up. It says, Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Now, when you read this, you can kind of think, was he talking about the sailors who worship the false God and then... No, no, that's not what he's talking about. Because we get hung up on the word idols when we read this. But an idol is essentially anything that you trust or pursue more than God. In fact, in Romans chapter 1, we see this, that, that it was the idolatry behind the sin in the garden that caused Adam and Eve to fall. Adam and Eve wanted the fruit that, that more than they wanted obedience to God. They, they, they pursued the fruit. They put that above God's command and in their free will, they also choose free won't. And we saw the result of that decision. But Jonah had a moment of revelation where he says after that in verse 9, but I with a song of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. Jonah here we see after three days in the belly of the whale, he He surrenders. And we don't like the idea of surrender. We don't like the notion of it. I I like it when we talk about being willing, but but really surrender is the ultimate aspect of free will that, that aligns us with God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty works perfectly with our surrender. God doesn't come with sovereignty and despite our surrender, forces us into His plan. But God is a God so confident in His amazing plan for your life that though He is sovereign, He works with our surrender. We don't like this at all. I know I'm not preaching stuff that's gonna make you run home and put notes on Instagram and Facebook and and talk about how great the sermon was today because this idea of surrender really rubs against our nature. If, if we were good with surrender, because I mean, we want God to bless our finances, but God gives us a clear way for our finances to be blessed. He says, surrender the tithe and watch as your finances are blessed. But we say, God, no, just bless my tithe, bless my finances. God says, well, I surrender the tithe. No, no, God, I won't do that. I want you to bless my finances. We want God to bless our marriage, but we won't surrender what we look at online. We don't like the idea of surrender. But God's will for Nineveh was not destruction. Did you know that? In fact, if this was the case, then He wouldn't even be sending a messenger. His plan that was through their repentance, they would receive salvation. 
We see this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. He says, God is patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. Not just a select few. <laughs> everyone. In fact, if we were to fast forward to Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, we would see that because the city repented and they turned from their evil ways, the Lord did not carry out His destruction on the city as He had threatened. In other words, when Nineveh repented, God relented. And His purpose was that the city and His purpose for the city was achieved through working of His sovereignty and in partnership with Jonah's surrender. And I got to tell you that this is the place that God wants to lead us to, to remind us that He has given us free will in this life to choose and make decisions. God has empowered us with, you want to do this, you want to do that, go for it, do it. But whatever you do in word and deed, do it unto the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it unto God. But that's how you know you're in line with His will when you walk in His ways. It's very simple. But ultimately what, we, what God wants to know is, I am also offering you a free willing to be freely willing. I'm not trying to change your personality. I gave you that personality. You thought being introverted means that maybe maybe not meant to be used by God. God can use some of the greatest, most introverted people ever on the face of this planet. You don't have to just be an extrovert to be used by God. God wants to use you to connect with people like you. Your personality is perfect for God's purpose, but but in everything God's looking for surrender. Thank you for joining us here at this podcast. We hope it blessed you. And if you want to check out more about our service times, locations, or how to partner with us financially, check out vivechurch.org.